Hi, this is Dr. Hall, Lecture 17C. We're going to talk about uh, just two potential medical interventions for childbirth, uh, anesthesia in the form of an epidural and a C-section. So we've already actually talked about two potential interventions for childbirth. One is to induce labor, which is most commonly done by the use of pitocin, which is that synthetic oxytocin to get the uterus contracting. The other possibility is to use nipple stimulation or a breast pump, or even that prostaglandin medicine called mesoprostol to start or augment uh, uterine contractions. We also talked about an episiotomy, which is cutting of the perineal skin to allow the infant to be delivered more rapidly, and that generally the risks outweigh the benefits and that these shouldn't be done routinely, only if necessary. So let's talk about the other two that I've already mentioned. First, anesthesia. So anesthesia as a word just means pain relief or blocking of pain for a surgical procedure. So for childbirth nowadays, almost always, the, epi the anesthesia that's used for childbirth is what's called an epidural. So you've probably heard of an epidural before. It's really quite an amazing thing to be able to do. So epi means kind of above and outside of, and dural refers to the membrane that surrounds the spinal cord. So in this image on the left, you can see this membrane right here. I'm kind of outlining it in green. That's the dura that surrounds the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord, this yellow area in here. That's the spinal cord. It's actually nerves coming down from the spinal cord. So what we do is use some numbing medicine to numb up the skin here, and then make a pathway with a needle first into this space just outside of the dura, and then pass a plastic tube or catheter into that space. And that plastic tube or catheter then develops or delivers a numbing medicine, such as lidocaine, into that space. And so it numbs the nerves from that space all the way down. So usually then you get pain relief from the waist down. If they use a small dose, it just interferes with your sensation of pain, which is what the goal is. Uh, if you get too much, then it can actually make it so you can't move your legs either. That's too much. And so the way this is done, so you can see in the middle image, this is an anesthesiologist. And what he's doing is feeling the bony landmarks of the spine and getting ready to introduce the needle. So as you can imagine, here you are, you're in labor, having really painful contractions. And what you have to do is you have to sit down, kind of fold forward as much as you can and hold still, which is not easy, right? Because you might be having some contractions while they're doing this process. This third image is that tiny plastic tube. It's really small, that catheter. And you can see it coming out from the skin here. The other end of it is in that space, that epidural space. The brown that you see here is just some iodine that's used to kill any bacteria that might be on the surface of the skin. So it's a pretty amazing procedure and it's controlled by a pump. And so you can continue to use this for hours or sometimes even days if necessary. Epidurals are also used for surgeries, sometimes for a knee surgery or a hip surgery. Uh, it can be an excellent uh, way to do pain relief for all kinds of procedures. So there are risks and benefits with every single medical intervention, and the epidural is no exception. So pain relief is a huge benefit, right? So that can be feel life-saving if you've had hours and hours in labor. Um, it's really intense. It's really painful. The other thing that can be helpful is sometimes if you've had a really long, painful labor, perhaps the woman has been without sleep for 36 hours, right? So sometimes an epidural can allow that woman to take a nap for a couple of hours before all of a sudden now she has to push this baby out. 
The other thing that can happen that can be nice is sometimes it can help relax those pelvic floor muscles and make delivery a little bit easier. Sometimes people accidentally tense those muscles while they're trying to push the baby out and that can be difficult. So the risks with epidurals are low but not zero. First of all, you could have a complication from the procedure itself. So anytime we put a tube or a needle into somebody, we could accidentally introduce some germs and cause an infection. That's exceedingly rare. Another thing that could happen is we could hit a vein or something which would, could cause bleeding into that epidural space around the spinal cord. If that happens, it can cause a really severe headache and nausea. The risk of that is less than 1%, but if you're someone in whom it happens, it's really miserable. There's also a small risk of uh, placing stress on the fetus because epidurals also tend to decrease the mother's blood pressure and therefore decrease blood flow through the placenta. So it can stress or potentially damage the fetus and so anyone who gets an epidural has to be very closely monitoring. We have to have a heart rate monitor on the baby and follow them very closely. Make sure they have an IV. Sometimes we need to give them extra oxygen or sometimes even special medicines to get their blood pressure back up. So there is a small risk to the fetus from that. It also overall, if you have an epidural, it increases your risk of needing a c-section, of not being able to deliver vaginally. The first reason for that is that fetal distress, which I talked about above. So if the baby does develop signs of trouble, as indicated by their heart rate, then sometimes it's not safe to continue with labor in an attempt at a vaginal delivery, and you'll need to go to a C-section. The other thing that can happen is sometimes people just aren't able to push. Sometimes if you really can't feel what's going on, if the epidural is a little too dense, um, or maybe you just don't have as much adrenaline in your system because you're not in pain anymore, you're maybe a little bit too relaxed, uh, it seems to be that people have a harder time pushing babies out when they have an epidural versus when they don't. So there can be what we call failure of descent, meaning the fetus is not descending through the pelvis with pushing, um, and so that can result in a C-section. Finally, there are some folks that think that having an epidural and not having the pain of childbirth and then the natural endorphins and things that get released when you're in pain can interfere with the bonding process with the infant after it's born or that it detracts from this kind of transformative experience of birth, this kind of ritual uh, challenge, uh, so to speak. And that's kind of more of a philosophical thing. Um, certainly when I used to deliver babies, sometimes I would walk into the room and they'd like be watching Oprah or something, sitting around playing cards. And it's like, we're having a baby here. Like, can we please just turn off the television and focus? Because this is a big event, right? So sometimes it, we just need to remind people this is this is not just another day in their lives. So there are benefits for sure, but there are also risks. So if you or someone you love is considering an epidural someday, these are some of the things you want to be considering. And uh, be flexible, uh, because sometimes our best intentions turn out to be plans that aren't going to work for us. So the other medical intervention we're going to talk about is surgical birth, by which I mean a C-section. So a C-section stands for cesarean section, and so that's surgical delivery, right? We're going to do surgery. We're going to actually cut somebody open to get the fetus out, to get the baby out. So why would we do that? Well, obviously, if there's some type of medical emergency, either on the, the side of the mother or the side of the fetus, that we need to get the baby out now, right? And that sometimes happens. So, so there could be some type of medical emergency, some type of complication that's developing where we need to deliver the baby rapidly. The other thing that can happen, and I alluded to this when we talked about the risks of an epidural, is that sometimes people just aren't able to push a baby out, either because their cervix doesn't fully dilate, they don't successfully complete stage one of birth, they don't successfully complete labor, which can happen for a variety of reasons. Sometimes the cervix just won't fully open, 
or the mother is having trouble again pushing the baby out so that's the failure of fetal descent right so sometimes they might push and push and push and they're just not getting anywhere either because the baby's head is too big their pelvis is too small the baby's head is kind of crooked inside the pelvis and therefore won't fit or maybe they have an epidural and they can't really feel what they're doing and it's hard for them to coordinate their muscles other things that could uh, indicate a need for a C-section is if the person has had a previous C-section. And we'll talk about that further in a minute, but if you've had a C-section before, you have a part of your uterus that has been cut open. That part heals, but it heals with a scar. That scar tissue is not as strong and resilient as normal uterine tissue. So it increases your risk of having some uterine problems during the first two phases of birth, during labor and during pushing, um, because that scar tissue might potentially rip apart, and that's called a uterine rupture. So if you've had a previous C-section and you want to try for a vaginal birth, a lot of institutions and providers will allow you to try, but with very, very close monitoring. Uh, some other providers say, you know, gosh, the risk isn't worth it, and so let's just plan to have a C-section for any subsequent births so that we don't put that uterus at risk by having labor. Another indication for getting a C-section, another reason would be breech presentation, which is if the baby is bottom first instead of head down. So the thing about the fetal head is that it is designed, right, with those open sutures, those bones in the skull aren't fully fused yet. It can mold and conform itself to fit through the pelvis. And then when the, baby, the rest of the baby comes out, the hips are not flexed, right? So the pelvis of the baby is usually not hard to get out. It's pretty narrow. But if you're kind of bottom first and you're kind of folded in half at the hip joint there, that can often be really difficult. Not always so much because it's hard to get the bottom out, but then the problem is when it's time to get the head out, which is the biggest part, it's coming chin first, which is not that nice cone shape, wedge shape that can pass through. So getting the baby's head out um, in kind of going the backwards direction, bottom first, is much trickier than if they come out head first. So most of the time, if the baby is bottom down, breech presentation, they're gonna do a C-section. If you have a really, really big baby, which is called fetal macrosomia, somi means body and macro means big, as sometimes they'll just say, well, no way do we think you're going to be able to push this baby out. Um, or if you have a history of a really bad tear of the perineum. So remember we talked about that potential risk of a tear going into the anal canal. And those are really tough to repair, they're tough to heal from, and so if somebody has had that in the past, we might just say, well, gosh, let's not take the risk of that happening again, especially because you have scar tissue there now, let's just do a C-section. And then the final reason to do a C-section would be if the pregnant person has active herpes lesions in the vagina or on the vulva. And the reason for that is that if the infant gets infected with herpes as it's being born, it actually can cause very serious and sometimes fatal infections in the infant. So it's very rare that this happens, uh, but if it does, despite the fact that herpes is actually really common, it's rare that this happens, but if it does, then they would do C-section instead of a vaginal birth. So the procedure itself is making a, most typically, a horizontal incision kind of down here, whoops, well, not that big, low on the belly. And as you'll see, you have to cut through the abdominal muscles to do that, right? So you have to cut through the muscles of the abdominal wall and then get to the uterus and then cut open the uterus, which you can see they're doing here, and then pull the baby out and then pull the placenta out, right? So remove the placenta. Sorry, this is kind of a blurry picture. And then sew everything back up, right? Now, I don't like this fourth picture because the placenta or the uterus at this point will contract down, 
on itself. It won't stay big and open like that. It'll contract down on itself. But, you know, so you have to stitch up the uterus and then stitch up the abdominal wall muscles, stitch up the skin, all those different layers. So for those of you who aren't squeamish, there is a video clip on YouTube that I've also posted in Canvas of a C-section birth. This is a pretty rapid one, so they must be doing it um, because there's concern about the baby or the mom. Uh, so they're not taking a lot of time to kind of cauterize all the blood vessels and make sure there isn't a lot of bleeding. It's not very bloody, but um, if you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. Uh, but you can see how when they do expose the uterus and we get down to the uterus, the uterus has been stretched you know, to the size of a watermelon during the course of the pregnancy. So the uterine wall is actually quite thin and they have to be very careful to not accidentally cut the baby. You also get to see them uh, suction out the baby's nose and mouth and clamp the umbilical cord. So risks and benefits. So certainly the big risk is rapid and definitive delivery of the infant. You know you're going to get them out. Now it's all, and that's, that's usually that's why we would do it is we need that for some reason, right? For a medical emergency or vaginal delivery isn't working. Another benefit is that it can be scheduled. <laughs> so you know, sometimes doctors aren't too reluctant to say, yeah, let's go ahead and do a C-section. Um, when I used to deliver babies, I tell you, my patients almost always labored all night long and delivered at like four in the morning. It was awful. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's kind of nice if you can be like, oh, let's have your baby tomorrow morning at nine. <laughs> That's kind of lovely, um, but certainly is not sufficient reason to uh, justify the risks. And then as we mentioned, it avoids any vaginal or perineal trauma. So certainly if somebody's had a history of a severe tear, then that can be the reason to do it. So the risks associated with a C-section are the anesthesia, which is most typically an epidural. Uh, sometimes it can be a general anesthesia where they put you entirely to sleep, but an anesthesia itself has its risks. It also is a longer recovery, and this is something that I think people don't think about quite as much. So when you've had your abdominal muscles cut open like that, it really takes a good two to three months to feel kind of back to normal. So it definitely takes longer for people to recover from a C-section than from a vaginal birth. Because in a vaginal birth, nothing gets cut open. Um, and if there's any tearing, it's usually just the perineal skin, which tends to heal quite well. There's also the possibility of injury to nearby structures. So as the surgeons are, you know, cutting through, they could accidentally cut part of the bladder or the ureters or the intestines or any of the other things that are in your abdomen and pelvis. It also is, your, anytime you have um, surgery, you will have scarring, right? So you will have a scar. Usually they make it so low down that it doesn't show uh, unless you're naked, but uh, there will be scarring. And then there's this increased risk of complications with future pregnancies that I alluded to earlier. So one is that uterine rupture. So it, you have that scar from where you had a previous C-section. That tissue is not as strong as normal uterine tissue. And so sometimes with a subsequent labor, it might potentially tear open. If that happens, it's a life-threatening emergency for baby and mom. You have to go immediately to an emergency C-section. Um, and usually then they do fine, uh, but you know, it's a risk. And we'd rather plan a C-section than do it all of a sudden in a hurry if we can prevent it. There's also a risk of abnormal placental attachment. So sometimes when the placental, placenta attaches into the endometrium, if it attaches an area where there's some of that scar tissue, then it's not able to function quite normally. Most commonly in terms of its ability to detach after the baby is born. So you can have some problems then because the placenta doesn't fully detach, it only partially detaches, and that increases the woman's risk for significant bleeding or what we call postpartum hemorrhage. There are risks to the baby. So there's possible injury to the fetus, right? You could accidentally cut the baby. That's exceedingly rare. Um, but it's also harder for the baby to start breathing properly. So when we talked about that transition that happens after they are born, 
And during a vaginal birth, the baby's chest cavity gets squeezed as it's coming through the pelvis. And we think that helps squeeze out any amniotic fluid that is in there and in the lungs. And without going through that squeezing and you just kind of get pulled out of the uterus, babies have more trouble transitioning to breathing on their own, such that any time a baby is born via C-section, a pediatrician has to be there in the room. Normally for a vaginal birth, they don't have to be there. Usually the nurses are able to take care of anything the baby needs. But the risk of problems with breathing is higher with a C-section, so we need to have more staff on hand just in case. The other risk that we need to be honest about is it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> so, you know, all the operating room equipment and the surgeons and the technologists and the anesthesiologist and the scrub nurse um, and uh, all the suture material and surgical instruments and other equipment, it's just very expensive. So if we do a side-to-side -side comparison between vaginal births and C-section births, I'm going to kind of walk you through this. I don't expect you to memorize these numbers, but I want you to get a sense of what we're talking about with the differences here. So maternal death is a tricky one. So a vaginal birth, your risk of dying is 0 0.04 per 1,000, right? So way less than 1 in 1,000. C-section births, about 0 0.5 per 1,000. But now we have to remember, sometimes C-sections are being done because of some type of medical emergency. So sometimes it's the medical emergency itself that ends up causing the death, not the fact that you had a C-section. So when we look at due to the C-section itself, maternal death rates are still about four times higher after a C-section birth than a vaginal birth. Now they're still very, very low, right? So that's about one in 5,000. Yeah, so that's about one in 5,000. So they're still very low, but they are a lot higher than vaginal birth. Your risk of getting a thromboembolism, which is a blood clot, is higher if you have surgery versus if you don't. So anywhere from four to 15 times higher. And we'll talk about blood clots in 17D when we talk about complications. Your risk of infection, right? Anywhere from two and a half to 16%. And that might be something mild where you just take some antibiotics or it could be something severe where you end up in the hospital and on IV. Residual pain, this is interesting. So having some kind of uh, continued abdominal or pelvic pain, the risk is twice as high if you've had a C-section. A risk of scarring in your abdomen, which could cause problems with your intestines or your bladder, is about 5 out of 10,000 or 1 in 2,000. Infant death rates are higher. Now again, this is tricky because sometimes the reason we're doing the c-section is because of a medical emergency on the part of the fetus uh, but infant deaths are higher but we definitely see infant respiratory problems as i mentioned right without getting their chest squeezed as they get pushed through the pelvis respiratory problems are about three times more likely your risk of a uterine rupture in the future right where the uterine wall kind of tears open is five times higher if you've had a c-section and then those placental problems right so the rr here means relative risk i'm sorry i didn't uh, explain that earlier so if we said okay the baseline risk of a problem with how your placenta attaches or detaches right if we just compare the risk of that for c-section births versus vaginal births what we find is if you've had one private previous c-section you have a three times higher risk of those placental problems if you've had four previous c-sections your risk is 45 times higher right so we want to avoid multiple c-sections if we can so for medical interventions, we'd already talked about induction, most commonly done with Pitocin, episiotomy and how it's usually not needed. And then for this section, we talked about anesthesia, which is most commonly in epidural, numbing medicine that's given to the area just outside of the spinal cord via a small plastic tube, 
It can provide significant pain relief, but there is a small increased risk of fetal distress and of needing a C-section, either because of fetal distress or failure to deliver vaginally. Uh, there's also a small risk of getting that bleeding around the spinal cord that we discussed. For C-sections, that surgical delivery of the fetus through an incision low on the anterior abdominal wall gives you rapid and definitive delivery of the infant, which is excellent, especially if there's a medical problem. But it has risks for both the fetus and the mother, and so therefore uh, the risk-benefit ratio is such that we should only do C-sections if there's a really good reason to do them. All right, so that's 17C. We'll next pick up with 17D, which is talking about potential complications.